Many of you may know Juan Bennett as the inventor of IPFS and Filecoin, but what you may not know is during his time at Stanford, he was a teaching assistant for a notoriously difficult course called CS140 Operating Systems. When you know that, it's not uh, too hard to see how something like IPFS could be so consequential. Juan is very generously offered to do an AMA, so if you're tuning in on the live stream, please direct message the at FIL Foundation Twitter account with any questions you might have for Juan. Now, please welcome the CEO and founder of Protocol Labs and most famous engineer in Hong Kong, no. Juan Bennett. <laughs> no. Thank you. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, that, I, I don't know if I can live up to that introduction, but uh, I'll try. Uh, hey everyone, great to see you. I'm gonna try and do a lot of this. So uh, the goal today is to just kind of do an open AMA on anything you want to talk about. Uh, could be uh, anything kind of uh, about any of the tech, or maybe public goods funding, or Falcon community. You know, whatever whatever is interesting and useful to everybody. And we'll be both taking questions from in person here, and I think on Twitter um, with at Falcon Foundation, at Phil Foundation, at Phil Foundation. Um, and great, so uh, always the first one is hard, so if you're feeling like maybe asking a question, definitely go for it. Thanks, Juan. I'm Tao Sheng from China. I have a question about the digital market. Could you please share the latest progress and the future direction of the digital market, which is the very, you know, Next big event of Filecoin. Yeah. Uh, so there's Thank a, a retail markets are the um, way in which Filecoin can do content delivery. So think of like the CDN um, part of the Filecoin network. And there's a number of different retail markets. Um, there's a broader project with a lot of um, software components and projects and networks that are evolving. Um, uh, uh, two networks that I know um, about, like one of them is the Saturn network, uh, which is a specific uh, retrieval market structure um, that is uh, building this kind of tiered cache architecture um, for uh, to layer on top of uh, Falcon storage providers. And that has, I think, a few thousand uh, retrieval providers already, um, and currently is uh, getting the, the performance and distribution of the CDN to match say, the IPFS gateway. And once we're able to match the performance of the IPFS gateway um, as it is currently, then the gateway itself will be able to be served by, by Saturn. And later on, that will get offered to other clients. Uh, and so that's kind of like where Saturn is. And there's already you know, thousands of people participating in that retrieval market, um, and I think earning already Falcon S rewards, um, and so on. Uh, there's other. Um, retrieval markets, I think Titan and Meson are two other projects. I know less about those, um, but I know they're uh, making a ton of progress on them. And um, yeah, you can find out more about them, I think, in retrieval markets. There's, retrial markets has a website that lists out all of the projects, so you can go check those out. I would expect that we can get kind of CDN level quality for customers sometime next year, um, but already even this year, starting to get the IPFS gateway itself uh, working well enough. Uh, so yeah, that's the in a nutshell. Cool. Uh, other questions? If you can like keep your hand somewhat raised so that we can go. And if you're upstairs, come downstairs for questions. <laughs> yeah, that'll be that'll be easier. Questions. Right there. Whoop. Hey Juan, uh, Zach with FEM team. Um, you know, we launched <laughs> back in March and we've seen some awesome growth. Uh, where are you seeing uh, some applications making the biggest impact, and where do you want to see these applications uh, go? Like, what applications in the future are you looking forward to? Yeah, so um, maybe I'll describe like three tracks that I see that are um, super interesting. Uh, one track is all of the DeFi primitives that are needed to bring um, uh, better, better structures and capital markets for the storage providers. So there's a lot of um, requirements the storage providers have in different businesses around the world. Um, to be able to um, uh, structure their, their businesses and whatnot. And so the, that whole set of flows is really crucial to the entire network. And there's a significant amount of adoption there already, and it's growing um, uh, pretty fast. But I would say even that, like, we should be you know, 5xing or 10xing that over the next you know, few quarters. Um, and, and so that's one track. Uh, there's a second track, which is kind of like the um, space where uh, I'm spending more time thinking about, which is 
the, the, the kind of other layer two style networks that are going to uh, come into Filecoin. So think of compute over data networks. Uh, like what we just heard uh, in terms of LilyPad, that's a, an exact example of the kind of thing that I'm talking about. Being able to do um, things like coordinate computation, being able to do things like the retrieval market stuff, uh, being able to just flesh out the entire platform with all these other kind of components and systems and services hooking on top of Filecoin using FEM. That's a whole track that I think is super, super interesting and, and valuable. Um, and probably the third track is just this kind of like more long tail of lots of different experiments and that are going through hackathons and so on, of especially things like that are consumer oriented. So things like social networks and so on that I think are, we're still in the very early days of, but will take many rounds of experimentation before they kind of like get really solid. So yeah, th those are kind of the three things that I'm paying most attention to and I think are, um, are pretty exciting. Other questions? Hey, Juan. Phil Paris actually kicked off uh, this weekend with funding the commons. Um, sounds like you were there. Um, if so, what was exciting about that event? Did you learn anything new? Um, or was there anything that came out of that event that was uh, extremely exciting for you to hear? Yeah. Um, so for everybody, Funding the Commons is a conference that brings together people thinking about um, uh, public goods funding, uh, game theory, and brings kind of the builders of Web3 with the academics um, in game theory and economics and so on. And the goal is to kind of build much better um, mechanisms for the provisioning and funding and running and governance of uh, large scale public goods. So think of like ways of better allocating funding, think ways of better coordinating projects to meet the needs of their constituents and so on. Um, so that is part of like this broader public goods, network goods oriented um, uh, world in Web3, which I think is super exciting and super promising. Um, probably some of the things that I picked up there um, that event also happened to connect with DSI, which the DSI workshop, which is a whole other um, side of like how do you use all the Web3 primitives to improve science, both from like the scientific publishing side or scientific fundraising side, or even like how do you deal with like all of the artifacts and the computation that you need to do in order to um, keep uh, papers around and reproducible and whatnot. Um, and so some of the things that I saw that were super interesting at this set of combined events. Um, are, yeah, some of like the, the latest demos of people actually doing this in production where you have all of the data for papers already being computed on with Web3 primitives, which is really, really cool. Um, and also the level of impact that, say, um, Retro PGF from Optimism is having. So um, Optimism started uh, on this kind of um, retro funding structure uh, as as well, and they've been running, they're now like, I think um, they've done two large scale experiments, they're gearing up for their third one, and yeah, they're having a lot of success with it, which is pretty great. Uh, cool. Yeah. Uh, are there maybe some things that um, people underappreciate or misunderstand about Filecoin, particularly the ones that don't follow it as closely and are not as technical? Uh, I could probably write a book about that. So can, do you want to constrain it? Um, I come from the investment community, and I was just wondering, you know, people have certain perceptions and snapshots of time over the past that maybe things have evolved to a certain point that maybe um, some frameworks need to be adjusted or some mindsets about Filecoin. Um, I mean, I think it's still, like, very broad. Um, maybe I'll highlight two tracks of things. One is I think the broader community sometimes doesn't attribute the credit to the Filecoin network or to the Filecoin community for certain things. Like, they, they look at certain important results, but it doesn't get kind of like attributed all the way back. And so there's kind of like, the broader community doesn't know how much amazing tech or products or impact is achieved by our community. And usually once people understand, they're like, whoa, what? Like, you guys are doing so much, that's crazy. Um, and so kind of figuring out how to, how to solve that would be a good thing of like helping the whole rest of the community understand and attribute how much is coming from this community. Um, the second one, I think the the layering of economic primitives is too complex and too dense, and so it takes real effort to understand how the entire economy works. And so simplifying that can uh, both simplifying that through better explanations and better mechanisms uh, will be will be really good and valuable. That would be my guess. Um, I do think that this has 
perception broadly has evolved a lot over the last three, six, nine, 12 months. And yeah, just even at ETC this week, um, and at Phil Paris, like there's been a, an enormous amount of um, uh, both like many more groups understanding the everything that's going on in our community. Yeah. So I think it's like pretty good positive trajectory. Yeah. Oh, three. <laughs> Hi, um, I think you've talked about before authors or thinkers that have inspired you. I'd actually love to hear about ones that you watch in the free time that I'm assume, assuming you <laughs> somehow have. Um, yeah. Any authors, books, uh, movies, etc. cetera? Yeah, it's a um, great question. I mean, I think um, I used to, con the, the reason this question is kind of tricky now is that I used to consume a lot more like larger works like books and so on. And now a ton of the reading and thinking that I do is like much smaller scale and like bite-sized. So this includes like YouTube videos and tweets and all of the, that kind of stuff. And there's an enormous amount of thought that propagates through these networks, which I think is pretty, pretty good. Um, although very hard to keep track of and very hard to like bundle and then point people to. Um, maybe I'll just reference like some of what I think are like the Mo like best books around. Um, probably at the top of my list would be um, The Beginning of Infinity by David Deutsch, which is a um, scientist, uh, theoretical physicist slash philosopher, um, which walks through um, kind of a better grounding for how we know things in general and how that connects with all of the different branches of us trying to figure things out in the universe and how do you pull those together. Um, and talks about like one of the most amazing optimistic visions of the future that I, you can ever find. Uh, so that I would leave you with that single rec. Hey Juan, my name is Landon Gardner. I'm from Web3 Toronto in Canada. Um, I've seen you guys do a few things in Toronto. We're big on you know building city networks and Web3 cities, and you know Toronto is like our pilot scale for that. And I'm you know, curious about how you think in terms of like mass adoption of crypto and Filecoin, like what you're thinking is like the sort of best way to sort of bridge that gap. I mean, I find at ETHCC and these conferences, it's very technical heavy with Web3 people. And you've got 99% you know, of the world is not engaged in this. And um, we're thinking about, you know, how do we flip that? You know, is it, and I just love some of your thoughts on like why, like, you know, even Filecoin, which I only learned about what Filecoin was since I've been here in the last few days. Um, but, you know, like moving from, well, why not an AWS server? Why a Filecoin server? You know, and one of our startups in our incubator, you know, is a D-PIN, and I'm just sort of curious if you could talk a little bit about why D-PIN matters and sort of what Filecoin does with that yep. as well. Um, so, uh, also very broad, and maybe I'll grab onto like the first part of your question, which is kind of like, how can this broader community um, make it way easier and more accessible to understand what's going on in this entire field? Um, I think part of the problem, so, so, so this is kind of mixed. I think one, one part of the problem is um, a lot of the tech and products that are being built um, are very close to large scale financial use cases, which gives those products and services an out in being able to have a much smaller number of people interacting with them while already generating a big enough business. So there's less of a pressure to reach mass market with tons of people in the world. Um, and so that means that a lot of the systems and products end up building things that are um, initially don't start inaccessible, but they add like one or two or maybe three hurdles, and those start getting composed together. And so suddenly you get into an experience where in order to use a Web3 oriented product, you have to jump through like 10 or 15 different hoops of trying to figure out what any of this means, let alone how to use it. Uh, and a ton of different options. Like um, first, like oh, you need to connect a wallet. Like okay, great. Like what? What is a wallet? Why? Why is this different than my browser? Um, which of these wallets should I use? Oh, this one works with this kind of application, and this one doesn't. Like this one has this kind of fees. What are fees? What are gas fees? Like suddenly, like you jump into this world of pain in terms of the user experience, and that just comes from the fact that there are pretty good sized businesses available, uh, and it just hasn't pushed. Um, those products and services to get extremely good in a mass market way. So 
my sense of how do we get out of here is that we need to start building very high quality consumer large scale mainstream products. That means that really means two two kinds of things: social networks and games. And those are the things that are going to help us push over the hump here because um, social networks inherently get a lot of their value from a huge, a, as big of a network as you can make. And that really forces everyone to produce super high quality, very easy to use experiences. And they'll provide the pressure for all of the layers of the stack underneath to simplify and refine to be able to be good enough. Uh, you can think of this as kind of like the same thing that happened with Web 1 and Web 2.0 of like the social networks, um, you know, today, um, social network products are so easy and smooth to use, but they, they really deal with hundreds of different complicated things underneath the hood. It's just that that refinement has been pushed by the need to appeal to this broad market, um, this mass market audience. And so we need that kind of pressure in this ecosystem as well. And so I just see so many projects being like, oh, well, it's good enough for like this smaller Web3 community, um, and like that's good enough. And it's like, no, actually, like that's just creating layers and structures that are very hard to access. And so we need to, we need to reach the level, level of quality that broad consumer products have. Um, there's another side note to this, which is building those things so far has been too difficult. So today, you can't quite build a social network on Web3 yet. Um, uh, there's the, the, the underlying infrastructure is just now getting there. Um, and even some pieces need to fall into place before you can really do something at the scale of like Twitter or um, uh, Facebook or Instagram or TikTok or things like that. You couldn't quite pull off that kind of a fast-growing, super smooth social network today with just the, the current Web3 prim primitives we have. And so there's some more work to do there. So that would be my like, guess as to why, why we're in this spot. And so the, the how do we get out of here is just r really hyper-focus on super high-quality product user experience um, things. Cool. Hey, Juan. So I had a question. Uh, so there's ETHCC going um, aside from Fit Paris, where there's a lot of you know, different chains, infrastructures, companies, and so a lot of people working on a lot of dif different projects, tackling some of the troubles you just talked about. Um, and I know we, we launched a FVM early this year um, that helped with like integrating to some of the tools, some of the apps that exist there. Um, is there any plan in the future to continue and try to work with the people over there, uh, building stuff over EVM based chain, but that do not like try to go and, and deploy over the Falcon network? Yeah, yeah, we do. So um, uh, Falcon is one of the most collaborative communities and networks in the entire crypto space. From early days, a lot of our tech has been used by many other groups, especially the Ethereum community. So um, you can think of the Falcon community and the Ethereum community as having super high overlap. It's part of like why we coordinate and come out here to in the same week to be here as well, because so many of our projects and groups and teams overlap. And we, sh we do a lot of shared work. So as an example, um, the Falcon community and the IPFS community built Lip2P, which is the core networking stack. And that now has been adopted by um, so many other blockchains and other systems, including Ethereum 2. And so that's an example of like Lip2P ended up powering um, uh, Ethereum 2, and then EVM came to power FVM. Yeah, so that's an example of like coordination. So there's a lot more like that. Um, I do think that today, the blockchains, especially the L1s, but even now it's starting to happen to the L2s, like there's too much tribal association that feels competitive or zero sum, and we need to get out of that. So finding better ways of like bridging between that will be really valuable. Uh, it's a tricky problem because like the tribal association gives you a very strong community sense and identity, and that comes at a like that gives you this boost, but it brings it saddles like like competitive dynamics that aren't really there where. In reality, this entire space either succeeds together or fails together. And so we need to kind of bridge those. Yep. OK, last question. I, I can take like two more, but it's up to you. Yep. OK, two questions. <laughs> yeah. uh, thank you. My question is about uh, organization in, uh, innovation. Uh, I, think, I think the Proto Labs is somehow previously is like uh, the target is uh, Bear Labs, but now it's uh, uh, protocol labs networks. Uh, I wanted to ask your the the source B 
behind the transition between PL to PLN? Oh, yeah. Um, so it's a great question. So um, just for everybody, in case you didn't hear it, um, PL transition from kind of being a single company into being a network of companies. And so kind of like why, where, where is that thinking coming from and kind of uh, why and so on. Uh, so this is a, there's two parts to this. Um, one part comes from recognizing that in the long arc of technology development, networks and ecosystems are much more successful than single companies. So if you want to do long-term, long really high-value innovation, um, you do better by creating a startup ecosystem than by doing a single company. Uh, a concrete example of this is to, to compare. The, the largest scale experiment run on this is the comparison between Alphabet and YC. So Alphabet was the attempt by Google to create a structure to be able to run many different large-scale R&D-oriented uh, startups and to do them within the same kind of broad corporation um, with some amount of separate separation, but still broadly under the same kind of dynamics and structure and whatnot. And YC is the exact opposite approach, which is you create a network of startups that go out and pursue many different possible trajectories to success, many different kinds of business models, and you focus on trying to increase the number of such experiments and the likelihood of success of each one of those experiments. Um, and in the last, so maybe you know, 15 years ago, a lot of people would have bet on Alphabet over YC in terms of like being able to do deep, long-term, large-scale innovation in R&D on extremely complex fields. Um, you know, things like self-driving cars or things like um, uh, AI or things like um, uh, aging and so on, T tons of different fields. And fusion, sort of that kind of stuff. But in reality, YC has greatly outperformed Alphabet with a small fraction of the capital involved. So the, the YC open network structure is dramatically more effective for long-term R&D than a single company structure. So that's like kind of one, one thread. The other thread is that in Web3 specifically, in crypto networks specifically, these ecosystems are networks of different participants and different groups, and they're not like, if, if you have single companies that are bigger than others, then it creates this pressure for that, those companies to get bigger and for the other ones to not succeed as much. And so you want to kind of stimulate the growth of a crypto network or by enabling many groups to all succeed together at kind of like different sizes. And so think of like, you know, the success case of say, um, Ethereum or Bitcoin compared to well, maybe I shouldn't call it names here, but um, there are other networks that are like much more centralized in terms of like there's really only like one development team, and like that's just not a successful crypto network. And so to have very successful crypto networks, you need an ecosystem of of a network of many different companies, and that is also very very successful. So PL is a kind of like a network or an institution that wants to do this very long term oriented R and D and wants to build crypto networks that are successful. And so we can best do that by creating a network of companies as opposed to a single company. So that's kind of the thinking behind all of that. Hopefully that was succinct enough. I don't know. Uh, uh. OK, last question over here. What do you think is the biggest blocker to getting more developers building on Filecoin Virtual Machine? Um, biggest blockers for development in in FEM, um, I would say, uh, I can think of like a, a, a few things. I don't know, I, I really don't know which one of these is the biggest blocker, but I'll, I'll mention a few. So one is, I think, just more, um, uh, just connectivity to actually using the storage primitives themselves, like being able to do more of the kind of like magic that you can get out of Filecoin specifically versus kind of any other smart contract platform. So that means tighter connectivity to the storage primitives or tighter connectivity to computation around the storage primitives, right? So when we have things like Lillipad um, and other things like that scale, um, being able to issue computation over the storage um, or being able to have verifiable computation over the storage, like that, that kind of stuff will create a much bigger draw for people using FEM specifically. Um, there's probably some other layer around kind of like 
developer experience just continuing to refine and improve. Um, projects take time to refine and improve, and so there's probably like little hurdles here and there that just need to get smoother and smoother and smoother and easier. Um, there's one third one, which is I think like a big one long term, not a big blocker right now, but a big one long term. It's how do you add new additional runtimes into into FEM. So FEM started with the goal of being this hypervisor that enables many VMs on top, like EVM is one of them, but you can think of other VMs uh, and so on. And so how do you enable these runtimes to be added? Uh, fun fact, we've been on this quest for like you know a year or two now, and I just saw on Twitter earlier that somebody, uh, that Solana is now orienting its VM along the same strategy, and I was like, oh great, like they also saw the that, that trajectory. So my prediction is that we'll have most VMs across the Web3 ecosystem are going to end up with like this hypervisor structure with all of these different runtimes on top, and like that's the good long-term bet in like the two, three, five-year landscape. And it's going to take a while while we figure out how all these different runtimes have to be able to invoke and call between each other. How does that work with different chains? How does that work with scalability primitives and so on? So I think like it's a lot high complexity there, um, but I think broadly most ecosystems are navigating to the same spot, which is um, hypervisors and um, large scalability through through partitioning of the network. Yep. Do you think we have time for for one more? Sure. Yep. Here. Here. Thanks. Hi. Uh, out of your experience with the market highs and lows, what's your advice to the startups in this current market situation? Yeah. Great question. Um, so. Uh, the first round of advice on this is to like zoom way out and look at the graphs of markets over the last hundred, couple hundred years. Like look at 100 years or 200 years and you can see the trajectory of economies through like very severe booms and busts. And so that can give you the confidence and comfort that overall um, economies, how economies function. Now, it's not a super great comfort in that like you know sometimes big things do change and the whole world changes but that would be like a bigger th at that point it's like you know much bigger kind of question um, however so, so that kind of like you, you can look at how big each downturn is in terms of years how long were these depressions in history um, and r roughly most of them tend to be somewhere between two to three years or like five or six years in the in, in the most and most of them are in like the two to three year mark. Um, and so that roughly gives you a sense of like how a, a bus cycle looks um, and then how you know, broader boom cycles can be. Um, so that's kind of one, one piece. The second piece is um, really think of international innovation. These days, you don't have to be coupled only to one single um, economy. You can find which economies are actually booming while others are busting and then go and raise capital there. Um, so if some big economy is busting, find the ones that are like starting up, right, or, or, or starting to grow. A good example of this is like in 21, the um, U.S. and Europe were kind of like booming really strongly, and China and Hong Kong and other places were kind of busting, and so it made sense for a lot of people to kind of go to, towards the U.S. and the EU. Um, now, especially in crypto specifically, there's kind of like this broader bust in. Um, in the US and the EU. And at the same time, we now have Hong Kong opening up again. Japan is opening up again. Um, and so those other markets are now growing, right? And so like, there's a different scale. So you can kind of figure out and follow where, where things um, evolve. The other part is like winters are difficult. And so that means just really be prepared to weather those winters. Really know what part of the cycle you're in and how you should be tuning what you're doing for that cycle. In like the height of the summers, time is really scarce, capital is cheap, and so you really want to kind of throw capital at problems and move really quickly through, through things to grow as fast or faster than other groups. Um, in the winters, that entirely flips, and so then capital is really scarce, time is very cheap comparatively, and so you want to kind of s do things that save a lot of money, things that you, you become much more revenue-oriented and revenue-focused and so on. And so you just have to tune your approach depending on what part of the cycle you're in. Um, I would also kind of like recommend um, in these winter times, A, it's a great time to invest because all the valuations are lower. Conversely, if you're fundraising, it's not a great time to raise. So raise as little as you really need so that you can raise more once, once you get back into like summer times. Um, so that would be kind of like my broad, broad advice. Um, and so just be hyper-focused on like 
revenue generation, runway, and kind of like raising what you need at like reasonable valuations, but not not over over give. Like I've just seen a lot of investors take the uh, take advantage of the moment and push for like really low valuations that you know maybe a year ago they would have like been three or four five times bigger, um, and they probably will be two or three times bigger in a year or a year and a half, and so just you know factor that in. Um, cool. Thank you so much. Really great to be okay. here. All right.